Так, а, окей, it's time. Ладно, отключаюсь. Ага. Uh, so it's time for our second lecture for today. And okay, Zahar, please start your lecture. Zahar, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you very uh, okay. much. Yes, so we, we can start the lecture. Let me remind you that we are considering an example um, um, in which we project a polytop to a random linear subspace. So it is example three of Puffentranger and Schneider. And um, Schneider. And the setting is as follows. We can take a polytop. You may imagine a full dimensional polytop for simplicity. And then we take a uniformly distributed linear subspace. So L is uniformly distributed on the Grassmannian of all D dimensional subspaces in Rn. We are now in Rn. And P, pi denotes the orthogonal projection. 2L. And then we are interested in the number of k dimensional faces of the projected polytop P. This is our question. And now we introduce the following notation. So I, I remind you just about our notation. So for F, which is a k dimensional face of P, we defined the tangent cone at F, namely the tangent cone at F is, uh, I will write the definition in a slightly different way. We take some point Y in the relative interior of F, which means that it is an F, but not in a face of small dimension. And then we look from this point Y to, to all directions and those directions which show inside the polytop are in the tangent cone. So we can write this as follows. We can take P minus Y. So the differences of all points from P with Y, but these do not form a cone. And then we have to multiply them with Lambda and take the union over all Lambda greater than zero. And this is a cone, which is called the tangent cone. And uh, it's difficult to draw a picture. So for example, if we are in dimension two and we are here, then the tangent cone is ess essentially this one. And, and here, here is the polytop, but the tangent cone is then essentially this angle shifted to the origin. This is zero. And for example, if we are in dimension two, but we take a, a, an edge, if this is our F, and this is our y then. Then the tangent cone, and, and here is p. Then the tangent cone is just a half space. So it's it's the set of all directions which show which look inside the polytop. And similarly in dimensions three and higher. And the dual cone to the tangent cone is called the normal cone. So f n of f p is defined as the t of f p dual and it's called the normal cone at F. So for each phase, we have such a cone. And then at each phase, we can define two types of angles, the internal angle and the external angle. So V of F P is the internal angle and it is just the solid angle. Alpha is the solid angle of a cone of the tangent cone. This is the internal angle. And gamma of FP is called the external angle, and it is the, uh, the angle of the normal cone. So it is external. And again, to give some example, for example, if we consider this polytop, then the internal angle is just this one. So it's just this angle here. 
and the external angle is just well this one so this is gamma and eta is here inside and similarly in, in high dimensions and now we want to compute the number of expected number of phases of the project polytop so we uh, have done the following we the, the main idea is that that we take all phases of the original polytop f in the original polytop of p and we look whether such faces survive under projection and a face survives under projection if and only if the direction in which we project do not intersect the tangent cone this is the main idea so we have to sum here the probabilities that the tangent cone at f p intersected with the orthogonal complement of l which is the direction in which we project so to say is trivial is zero and then we have to compute such a sum over all faces and now this is almost the Grassmann angle. In, in the Grassmann angle, we have not equal to. The Grassmann angle is the probability that something intersects something. So this can be written as f in fk of p of one minus this, the probability of the complementary event, p of fp intersected with l, l orthogonal is not zero. And this is the Grassmann angle. So this is this is gamma, gamma d, because this has dimension. The dimension of this is n minus d, and then the definition of Grassmann angle is such that we have gamma d here. And after that, we can use the Crofton formula, which computes the Grassmann angles in terms of the intrinsic volumes, and we obtain the following: the sum over all faces f in f k of p. Uh, and then the sum over, or maybe maybe I, I, I will write it in two steps, one minus two times the sum over all nu or v of d plus l, where l is equal to one, three, five, and so on, of the tangent cone and now we can simplify it a little bit. Namely, we know, recall the relations for every cone, which is not a linear subspace. We have that the sum of the intrinsic volumes is one and the alternating sum, oh, I'm sorry, plus, minus, and so on is zero, which means that the sum of the odd numbers is one half and the sum of the even numbers is one half. If we just add or subtract them, we get that zero plus v2 plus v4 plus and so on is one half and v1 plus v3 plus fünf plus and so on is also one half and now we have here if we if we write if we write two in front of the sum then we have the sum over all f in fk of p and then we have one half minus and then the sum overall well with over indices d plus one d plus three and so on and we can write it as the sum overall other indices by these relations so we get the sum l equals one three five and so on over v d minus l t of f p f p so we can express the expected number of phases of the projected polytop as a sum over all phases of the original polytop and then we have to take here the conic intrinsic volumes of the tangent cones and now the conic intrinsic volumes of the tangent cones can be computed explicitly so let me write down this formula finally we get the following result so the expected number of k phases of the projected polytop is two times the sum over all f in fk of p times the sum over all l equals one three five and so on and then we can compute this um, angle as follows so recall that in order to compute the d minus l 
conic intrinsic volume. We have to take all d minus l face or all faces of dimension d minus l of this cone. And for each such face, face, we have to take the internal angle and multiply it by the, by the normal angle. Now, what are the d minus l dimensional faces of this cone? Okay, so imagine it's very difficult to draw a picture again, but imagine we are in dimension two and the simplest case is when this is our f is just a vertex. Then the faces of the tangent cone correspond to the faces of the polytope which contain f. And the dimension is the same. So if I have a face which contains f with some dimension, then in the tangent cone, I have a face of the same dimension, which contains f, which uh, just a face of the same dimension. So I have to take the sum over all faces g of, of the tangent cone, but they correspond to the face of the original polytope f d minus l of p of dimension d minus l that contain f such that f is contained in g and then for each such face i have to compute the internal angle of f at g this is the this is this internal angle in some sense and then we have to multiply by the normal angle and it's more difficult to imagine but the normal angle is just the normal angle of g in p. This uh, is not easy to imagine probably, but let's believe it for a moment. And then we get this final formula. So this is the formula of an dimensional derived by them. And it expresses the expected number of faces of the, of the project polytop through the internal and external angles of all of these faces inside the polytop in some sense. Now, let us consider some particular cases of this setting. So let us take the cube. So special cases. Case one, the cube. P is equal to zero, one, M. Now, uh, if we have a face of a cube for F is a K dimensional face of the cube, what is the internal angle of F inside P? Well, uh, it's easy to compute because maybe I, I will write it on the, on the next page, next line. So what is the internal angle of F inside P? Well, we have to look at the tangent cone. So what are the faces of the cube? The face of the cube are smaller cubes, which are on, on the boundary, right? And um, the tangent cone is just the, well, if the face is k-dimensional, then the tangent cone contains the k-dimensional Euclidean space, which corresponds to that face. It's the directions which are, which look inside this face. And there are also directions of the remaining dimension are n minus k plus, which have which look inside the cube. And therefore, the internal angle is just, well, this has angle one, and this has angle one over two to the power n minus k. So it is one over two to the power n minus k for the cube, where n is the dimension of p and k is the dimension of f. And what is the normal angle? Well, it is the same because the dual cone n of fp is, well, it is not equal, but it is isometric. Let me write it here, isometric to, it is isometric to what? Well, the dual of the, of this is zero. The dual of the product is the intersection. So it's just a cone of, uh, it's just essentially it's just the dual of that one and the dual of that one is that one itself because this cone is self-dual up to sine so it is minus r plus n minus k and again the the angle is the same so this means that if we have f f is inside g is inside p 
then we have that b of fp uh, fg times gamma of gp which is the expression we, we had here is just one over two and then we have to subtract the dimension so dim dimension g minus f times dimension p minus g and we get n minus k here so all these terms are equal and they are equal to this power of two and we have just to compute the number of these terms for the cube and so we get the following the expected number of faces of dimension k of the projection of the cube onto a random d-dimensional subspace is given by the following formula first of all we have to we have this two and then we have to compute the number of faces of the cube so it is two two and then the number of faces of the cube is the following i have to choose k coordinates which are free for a k-dimensional phase and all the other coordinates should be zero or one should be fixed zero or one so i have so many possibilities and this is the number of faces of the cube now uh, then we have to take the sum overall l okay it is it stays as it is and maybe i will write here the term beta times gamma it is one over two to the power n minus k so these two terms cancel and then we have to take the sum overall l one three five and so on and then we have to compute the number of faces g which contain f and this is some combinatorial problem maybe i will not not explain the the details but it's just a combinatorial exercise to show that it is like this and after simplifying this by the pascal or, or by the relation of the pascal triangle we get the following answer so it is 2n minus k times the uh, times times sum which i will write explicitly it's n minus k minus one choose n minus d plus n minus k minus one choose n minus d plus one plus n minus k minus one choose n minus d plus two plus and so on and at some point it, it becomes zero so this is the expected number of faces of the projection of the cube and effect which i will unfortunately not be able to prove here but which is interesting is that this is not only the expected number but for the cube it is even the almost sure number so it is even the almost sure number of k faces that is the number of k faces of the projection of the cube without any expectation is equal almost surely so for almost every projection with respect to the uniform distribution is given by that formula two so two times n over choose k times the sum which is a little bit surprising so it doesn't matter how you project the cube how you draw the cube in the plane for example suppose you want to draw a, a picture of an n-dimensional cube in the plane then if you want your picture to be correct the number of k faces should be given by that formula or at least correct in the well it, it can be of course smaller because under some projections it may happen that it is smaller but a generic projection should have this number of k faces um are there any questions at this point we uh, yes so why is it why is it so uh, why is it so okay a Almost surely. is a simple explanation is the following one consider all the normal cones of the cube all the normal cones together they form a fan which is essentially the the dissection of the space into orthons so if, if we consider all the normal cones of the cube at vertices say first then these are just orthons no not at vertices yes at vertices the normal cones at vertices are just these orthons and the normal cones at faces are just these smaller dimensional things and now if we take a plane and intersect all these normal cones then the number of intersections is constant 
Ah, okay. So the number of normal mm -hmm. cones intersected is constant, as we know. And this means that by duality, the number of tangent cones intersected is also constant. And this yeah. is what, okay. what, what, what matters here. Thanks. So this is the explanation why it is almost surely constant. Now, um, the second example is, um, yes, uh, the second example is, so it's second special case B, I will just mention it without deriving all the details explicitly. Suppose that P is the regular simplex. Say with n vertices, with n vertices. Um, as we know by a result of Baryshnikov et al, this model is essentially equivalent to the Gaussian polytope. So let G and D be the Gaussian polytope that is the convex hull of n points, which are IID standard Gaussian in the d-dimensional space. And then by the mentioned result, the k vectors of the projection of the simplex. So we, we can take a simplex, regular simplex, project it to a random d-dimensional subspace, or we can take the Gaussian polytope and it's the same in distribution as far as such functionals as the number of phases are concerned. So uh, this setting applies to both models. The co corresponding results applies to both models. And one can then derive a formula for the expected number of faces of the Gaussian polytope in terms, so this is explicit, in terms of external and internal angles. Angles of the polytope which gener generated this special case, so of the regular simplex of the regular simplex. So it's it's an explicit formula, valid for O N and D. And then Affentrang and Schneider analyzed it and they derived uh, say uh, just just to review known results, they derived a formula for this number in the asymptotic regime when n goes to infinity. So let d be fixed, k be fixed, and n goes to infinity. So we are in fixed dimension and we take more and more Gaussian points. Then there is a formula for the expected number of phases of this and it is, okay, it, it doesn't matter what, what we have here, I will not use it, but it's some explicit expression in terms of the internal angle of the simplex. So it's beta over of the k dimensional phase of a d minus one dimensional simplex times pi log n d minus one half. So this is a formula for the expect number of phases. And now the, there were many results, asymptotic results in this setting. I will just mention some of them just for, for completeness. So for example, we, it is known that if we take the Gaussian polytope, then it is almost a ball of radius square root of two log n. Namely, if we divide it by square root of two log n, then in the host of distance or in the space of the convex bodies endowed with the host of distance, because G and D is a convex body in D dimensions normalized, then in the space of all convex bodies with the host of distance, this converges as n to infinity to the ball, almost surely. So it gets closer to the ball and it is not surprising that the volume of G and D then behaves asymptotically is asymptotically equivalent to the volume of the corresponding ball. So it is the volume of the unit ball times square root two log n to the power d. So it's not surprising in view of, of the first result. And uh, there are works of Davidov and co-authors who prove that 
essentially the same holds for convex hulls, not only of Gaussian points, but also of Gaussian processes. Same for, say, Brownian motions, or more general, of IAD Gaussian processes, essentially. And uh, one may, of course, also ask, knowing the expectation of the FK, what is the variance and what is the central limit theorem for that? So if we, if we have many Gaussian points, right, then the polytope has many sides, the Gaussian polytope. And one may ask whether central limit theorem holds and such results are indeed available. So central limit theorem and variance were obtained by by Barani Wu and Kalka Jukic. But this requires methods which are not, not, not close to what we are doing here in this lecture. We are doing explicit computations here. Okay, let me now finally mention another example. And uh, this example is just a very, very very, very simple special case of a theory which I don't understand very well. That's why I mentioned only a very simple special case. So namely in the 70s, Vershik suggested that some problems of linear programming can be analyzed by taking the data to be random and by asking what is the probability that the problem is solvable, for example. And such problems usually lead to computation of certain Grassmann angles. So the notion of Grassmann angles becomes or is closely related to linear programming by this idea. So he suggested Grassmannian approach to linear programming and convex optimization. And this has been later de developed by Donoho Anor and in the work of, in the paper of Amelungsen and co-authors. And I will just consider a very simple example of this, I think very interesting phenomenon. So we consider here a problem of compressed sensing which can be stated as follows. Suppose there is an unknown vector x star, which has n coordinates, and we know that they are all positive. So it is known that they are positive, but the vector is unknown. Now, uh, instead of the vector, we know it's linear transformation by a matrix A, which lowers the dimension. So A is from Rn, to R D, a matrix, and we want to consider a random problem, so we take it to be a Gaussian matrix, where N is much greater than D. Now we know, uh, so suppose we know the vector Y given as AX star. So we know the transformation of the vector. But since the transformation lowers the dimension, this doesn't recover, doesn't allow us to recover the vector usually, right? Because D is smaller than N. So knowing Y, we cannot recover X, X star. But assume we know additionally that X star is sparse. So X star is K sparse meaning that it has only k coordinates which are non-zero. So that is the number of i's such that xi star is not zero is k or at most k. Uh, the question is with this information, so knowing y and knowing that the pre-image is sparse, can we reconstruct x prime? And now the main observation, 
or the observation which relates this problem to Grassmann angles is the following one. Mm. The sparsity condition means that this means that X is in the relative interior of some phase of dimension K. So F is a K-dimensional phase of the orphan. Because the K-dimensional phase of the orphan are given exactly by the condition that some that K coordinates are free, non-negative, and all other coordinates are fixed to zero. This defines a K-dimensional phase of the orphan. Now, um, so we know that X is in this in some k-dimensional phase. We don't know in which phase, by the way. So there are many and we don't know in which one it is. But uh, suppose, uh, and, and what do we know? We also know that our vector we are looking for, that X star we are looking for is in the pre-image of A. So we, we have here, here we have, sorry, here we have Rn. Here we have the map A, here we have RD, which has smaller dimension, and here we have our Y, which is AX star. Y is known, and this means that essentially we know that here in the pre-image of Y, uh, our X star lives somewhere, but we don't know where. And now, if this pre-image intersects Rn plus, so the cone, just at one point, then this point is our X star, then we can reconstruct it. So the problem is, or the problem, we have a problem. We, 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 we don't, we, we cannot reconstruct X prime, X star, if this pre-image intersects the interior of our, of our orphan. So it, it intersects definitely the boundary at X star, but if it also goes into the interior, then it is bad for us. Then you can reconstruct. And so the observation is that if X star is in some is in some F, which is a k-dimensional phase of the orphan, and F survives under the map A, so if F stays a phase of the image of the orphan, of F A times the orphan, then we can reconstruct. Then A minus one Y, the pre-image intersects Rn plus at one point, which then is necessarily what we are looking for at one point and exact reconstruction is possible. So um, the question is now essentially the same, right? We, we are interested in the Grassmann angle now because the probability that such intersection occurs is Grassmann angle and uh, it would be very good if all the faces would survive. So suppose that all faces of the orphan remain faces of the projected, projected cone. If this is so, then we can reconstruct, then we can reconstruct every sparse vector, right? So if the condition holds that the number of K faces of the, of the projected of the Gaussian projected orphan is the same as the number of faces of the original orphan. And by the way, it is just n over k because face is defined by a subset of coordinates which are allowed to be non-zero. Then reconstruction of every k sparse vector is possible. And now we are led to the question whether the number of faces of the projected orthant is as maximal as possible because what is the projected orthant? 
it is well the orphan is spent by the as a positive how by the just by the coordinate by, by the standard basis vector e1 en and the projected orphan is spent by a e1 a e2 a e n so these are n vectors and if every k subset of these vectors forms a face of the projected orthant, then it is good. So this is called, this condition is called neighboringness of the polytope, or in this case of the cone, meaning that say every generator is a face or every subset of two generators generates a face and so on. And I will not, I will not do it explicitly here, but in these works of these authors, Vershik and than all the other authors, it has been shown that in many cases there is this neighborliness phenomenon, which means that all the, which means that the number of faces of the projected polytope is as large as it can be, with probability going to one. So one can show that in certain regimes, as n goes to infinity and d goes to infinity, the number of faces this holds with probability going to one. And this means that reconstruction is possible. Okay, now I think we can uh, finish this part of the lecture and go to the next one. And the aim of the next part of the lecture would be to compute the characteristic polynomials of the hyperplane arrangements, namely of the reflection arrangements and some others. And then to at least to state that these characteristic polynomials are essentially or essentially give the intrinsic volume. So we will compute the <laughs> we will compute the uh, the intrinsic volumes of the wild chambers, for example. So uh, this is the next part of the lecture, and it is called hyperplane arrangements. So here in definition, a hyperplane arrangement is a finite collection of hyperplanes in RD. So it is a finite collection of affine hyperplanes planes in, well, let us call this Euclidean space RD. So an arrangement A is a set H1, Hm, where Hi are hyperplanes, and it is linear if Hi contains zero for every i, so if all the hyperplanes are linear. Now the next definition, the characteristic polynomial, polynomial, of an affine hyperplane arrangement A is defined as follows. The characteristic polynomial at T is the sum over all subsets B of the arrangement A. So all subsets of this, I mean, all subsets of one M, right? All subsets of the M element set, H1, Hm. And then we have here a sign, which may be plus minus one. And then the term t to the power, which is the dimension of the intersection of the hyperplanes from this subset. So this is how it is defined, the characteristic polynomial. I will show some examples in the following. Uh, maybe a simple remark. Um, for example, we may take b, so the subset b may be, may be empty b is allowed to be empty and if it is empty then the intersection is the whole rd and so the dimension of the intersection is d and we have the term t to the power d and there are no other terms of the form t to the power d so we have that the characteristic polynomial starts with t to the power d i t the first term is t to the power d minus something. Now we can also take all the subsets of size one. Then we have just one hyperplane 
and the intersection of a one hyperplane with itself is then d minus one. And this means that the characteristic polynomial has the term t to the power d. And then we have terms of the form t to the power d minus one, one such term for each hyperplane. So, and the, si and, and the sign is here minus one. So we have minus the number of hyperplanes times t to the power d minus one plus and so on. So the first two terms are easy to characterize, but the others are more difficult. And now what is the main, main use of the characteristic polynomial is the, the Slavsky formula. It states the following. It states that the, so if one has an arrangement like here in the plane, then what is interesting is the number of components in which the plane is dissected by these lines. And the, the components are defined as the connected components of the complement of the union of the hyperplanes. And the, the, Slavsky, the formula of the, the Slavsky gives the formula for the number of these components. So the, the number of connected components of the complement are d minus the union of these hyperplanes is given by the value of the polynomial at minus one essentially. So it is R of A and it is up to sign the value of the polynomial at minus one. This is the first claim. And the claim, the second claim is that the number of bounded components, there are bounded components like this one and unbounded like, like this one. So the number of bounded components is B of A bounded and it is up to sign the value of the characteristic polynomial at one. So the values at one and minus one are interesting because they give this, have this interpretation. And now let us consider an example or first a definition. Definition. The hyperplanes H1 and so on H n in Rd are in general position if the following holds. So the hyperplanes are affine here. Uh, what, what is the condition of general position? Okay, suppose we take hyperplanes, p hyperplanes and intersect them. What is, what is the dimension of intersection? Well, for generic hyperplanes, if, if we add one hyperplane to the intersection, then the dimension should each time decrease by one. So if I would add here one new hyperplane, the dimension should decrease by one if they are somehow generic, right? And that's why this dimension should be D minus P. But if the dimension is already zero, or if this is already empty, then it cannot decrease after that. So this holds for all p smaller than d. It should be d minus p. In particular, if I take d hyperplanes, then their intersection should be a point. Like here, if I take two lines in the plane, the intersection should be a point. So something like that is not generic, is not in general position. Uh, and this holds for, uh, for all for all indices, i1, p smaller than n. But also there is another condition. If p is greater than d, then the intersection should be empty. H1, h i p is empty, the second requirement. So for example, for, for lines in the plane, 
example for lines in the plane. What do these conditions mean? For example, if we take p equals one, then it says just that the dimension of each line is one, which is always true. For p equals two, it says the dimension of the intersection is zero, which means that, and dimension zero means it is a point. If it would be empty, the dimension would be minus infinity by definition. So this condition means no two lines are parallel. And finally, for p equals three, we get the condition that h1, hi, intersected hj, intersected hk is empty, which means no three lines meet at, at one point. No three lines meet at a point. Which is uh, the usual condition of what one usually means by general position for lines in the plane. So something like this is forbidden and something like that is forbidden. Everything else is allowed. And now let us ask the following question after Steiner for the plane and Schleifli for the d-dimensional space also in the 19th century. What is the number of domains number of regions this generated by n hyperplanes in Rd. Well, in this form, it's not easy to answer or maybe very difficult to answer because this number is not constant. It depends on the position of the hyperplanes. But if they are in general position, then one can answer it. So in general position. And to this end, we need to compute the characteristic polynomial. So let us take n hyperplanes in general position in Rd. And then the characteristic polynomial can be very easily computed because then this dimension is just uh, d minus the intersection. So for example, we, we, the characteristic polynomial starts, as we know, it starts with t to the power d. The second term is the number of hyperplanes, which is n times t to the power d minus one. Now, what is the third term? In the third term, I take all intersections of two hyperplanes and then this dimension is d minus two. So the dimension is d minus two if we have two hyperplanes. So it's just the set of, it's just the number of the, it, it appears as frequently as the, as n choose two. And the signs here alternate. So it is then n choose two t d minus two minus n choose three d minus three because every three hyperplanes generate a term like this, and at the very end, plus minus one to the power of d. And at some point we choose d hyperplanes, then their intersection is a point of, of, of dimension zero. And then we have here in the characteristic polynomial t to the power zero. So we have a constant term. And in order to get the constant term, a constant term, we need d hyperplanes. So we need n, n, choose D. Now the, Zaslav, the formula of the Slavsky states that the number of regions of this arrangement is just essentially the value at minus one up to sign. So it is one plus n plus n choose two plus n choose three plus and so on plus n choose D. And this formula has been derived by Schleffen. Uh, so this is the formula by Schleffli and the number of bounded domains can be computed in the same way. Now in the next step, we 
uh, I would like to consider the um, or to compute the characteristic polynomials of the arrangements generating the wild channels. So let us compute. Polynomials, and it's a very nice computation, very un unexpected method of reflection arrangements. So, a reflection arrangement, there are two, or we, we shall consider two types of them, namely reflection arrangement of type a n minus one is the following collection of the hyperplanes in Rn. So it's in Rn and it is the following collection of hyperplanes. We take two coordinates and require them to be equal. So say x1 is equal to x2. This defines a hyperplane and then we allow i and j to be arbitrary. So i J and so for, for each pair of indices i and j, we consider such a hyperplane. And their union is, or not their union, the collection of the hyperplanes defined in this way is called reflection arrangement of type A. And reflection arrangement of type Bn is very similar. We take xi equals xj, xi equals minus xj, and xi equals to zero for all pairs i, j. And now these arrangements dissect the n-dimensional space, in, in both cases it is n-dimensional, into regions. They are linear, by the way, they all contain zero. So they dissect uh, the space into cones. And for example, so they dissect Rn into cones. And in the case a n minus one, these cones could look, for example, as follows. So what does it mean that, how, how, how shall we construct a cone of this uh, ar arrangement? Well, we have to take the half spaces corresponding to these planes. And the half space is, if I write here, greater or smaller. So I have to write in each of these hyperplanes, greater or smaller, and take the intersection. In many cases, such intersection will be trivial, will be just zero if I have a contradiction somewhere. So for example, I, I can could require x1 greater than x2, x2 greater than x3, but x3 is greater than x1. Then it, it is a contradiction. But if we have no contradiction, then the cone will look as follows. It would be a cone of the form x with some number smaller then x with some other number and so on, smaller than x with some last number where sigma is a permutation. So for example, it could be something like x2 smaller than x3, smaller than x4, smaller than x1. And we see this is the same as wild chamber of type A, isometric to wild chamber of type A up to permutation of coordinates. And similarly, in the BN case, the cones we obtain will be like this. It is some sign x sigma, sigma one smaller than some sign x sigma two, smaller than some sign x sigma n, and then greater than zero. Or epsilon one, epsilon n signs and, and sigma a permutation. So the simplest example would be zero smaller than x1, smaller than xn. And then we can permute them and take any signs. Now here we have n, n factorial chambers in the first case. So chambers or regions of the arrangement. And here we have two to the power n times n factorial regions. And now let us compute the characteristic polynomials of these arrangements. So the claim is now that the characteristic polynomial of the arrangement A 
n minus 1 is given as follows it is t times t minus 1 times t minus 2 times t minus n plus 1 and the characteristic polynomial of the arrangement b is t minus 1 times t minus 3 times t minus 5 times t minus 2n plus 1. And let us give a proof of this. The proof is very nice and it goes by a method which I don't... <laughs> let, me, let me say it later because you have to guess how it is called. And the idea of the method is as follows. Let, let A be some arrangement in general. Fully, at the moment, it is arbitrary, H1, Hn. And then let us compare two things. The first thing is the definition of the characteristic polynomial of A, of T. It is defined as follows. It is T to the power N minus, and then we have the sum overall intersections of size 1. So e from 1 to m of the t to the dimension of the intersection. Then I take all intersections of size of two hyperplanes. So 1 smaller than i, smaller j, smaller m. And then, and, uh, sorry, and then we have, and then we take t to the power dimension of hi, hj. So in, in the definition of the characteristic polynomial, we have to sum over all subsets. And then here I have take, I take all the subsets of size one, then all subsets of size two, then all subsets of size three. And then we have t to the power dimension of the intersection of this. So h i, h j, h k, and then plus and so on. So this is the first formula. And the second formula is, well, what, what do you think? This is similar to, to which formula? <laughs> it's somewhat similar to the inclusion-exclusion relation, right? So it's alternating sum of some things. So let us compute the number of elements in the union of some sets, some sets SI finite sets i from 1 to n where these are finite sets how to do it well we can take first the sum of the sizes of these sets and this corresponds to to that term n equals 1 to m the size of si but then we have to subtract the sizes of the intersections we have to add the sizes of the triple intersections and so on. Uh, yeah, minus and so on here, i minus j minus k and so on. So these formulas are very similar to each other. The signs are the same, but instead of, instead of some power of t, we have the size of some set here. So in this, if, 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 if they should be somehow isomorphic, then the isomorphism should turn this number, hi intersected hj intersected and so on, into the size of the set ai intersected aj and so on. And now suppose that our ai, our, our hub hyperplane, so I take AI to be our hard hyperplanes. Of course, the number of elements in the intersection is infinite, unfortunately. So it, it can be like this. But what do you think? Is, is there anybody who has never heard about it, but who has an idea how to, how to do it now? What, what is the next step to do? Somehow, is there any setting in which the hyperplanes or their intersections have finite size. And this size is some number times the dimension. 
is, is there any situation in which hyperplanes have finite, finitely many elements? And the number of these elements is a power of some number to the dimension. No idea. Well, is, is there any setting in which the in which vector spaces have finitely many elements? This hyperplanes are vector space and their intersections are vector spaces. Any setting in which the number of you know, the number of elements in a vector space is finite. Well, no idea. <laughs> If the field under, over which we consider this vector space is finite, right? And that's why the method is called the finite field method. And the idea of this method is to consider the same hyperplane arrangement over a finite field. So let, let P be a prime number and consider the same arrangement Over or in in the vector space f p to the power n, so the n-dimensional space vector space over this finite field. What does it mean? The same arrangement. This means that we take the same equations. So these equations or these equations, but now for variables which take values in the finite field. This can be defined, right? And then the size, and then everything becomes finite and the number of elements in H1, HI intersected HJ and so on is just the number P times the dimension of the space. Right? The number of elements in a linear space is then P to the dimension of the space. And then what did we prove? We prove the following that the characteristic polynomial of A at the prime number P, evaluate at the prime number P, is P to the power n, which is the size of the whole vector space P n, right? It's P to the power n minus, and then this sum is just the same as this one if Si are our hyperplanes. So it is minus the number of elements in the union of all hyperplanes from the arrangement. But now over, over this field. So it is the number of elements in the complement. And now let us consider, for example, the arrangement of type Bn. So for reflection, arrangement of type n. We have to compute the number of elements in the following set minus, inters, minus the union overall a, of all h, right? h from this b arrangement. Well, this can be written as follows. It is the set of all vectors in this space over a finite field with the following properties. With the property that they do not, are not contained in any of these hyperplanes. And the hyperplanes are as follows. They say either two coordinates are equal or two coordinates are equal up to sign or some coordinate is zero. So we have to require here alpha i, we have to require here alpha i is not equal to alpha j, alpha i is not equal to alpha to minus alpha j, for all pairs of alpha and i and j different, and alpha i is not equal to zero. So we know, now we have to compute the number of elements here. The number of elements fpn minus h. And it can be done as follows. So what are the choices of alpha one plus the four? Well, the only condition is that it is not zero. So we have P minus one choices because we have a field of P elements and zero has to be excluded. What are the choices of alpha two? 
What are the choices of alpha two? Well, we have to exclude zero and we have to exclude alpha one and minus alpha one. So three choices excluded. Now we have excluded two values. And by the way, these values are different and also up to they're different. Also alpha one is not the same as minus alpha two. So now for the, for the next one, alpha three, we have to exclude zero. We have to exclude alpha one, alpha two, and minus alpha one and minus alpha two. So we have to exclude five possibilities and so on. And for the last one, alpha n, we have so many. And this identifies the characteristic polynomial at all prime numbers. But if a polynomial is determined at all prime numbers by some formula, it is determined everywhere, right? So this gives Or it's not A, it's, it's, uh, it's in the case of B arrangement. So it is B arrangement, type B, or type B reflection arrangement. And then this gives that this is true for all. For all T. And this gives the proof of the characteristic polynomial for the for the reflection arrangements. Now, um, given this, we can do the following. So now I will, there is not much time left, I think 10 minutes or so. So I will just state a theorem which relates the characteristic polynomials of arrangements to the conic intrinsic volumes of the chambers of the regions of this arrangement. Namely, for each linear arrangement in Rn, linear means that all hyperplanes pass through zero, we have the following identity. Uh, by the way, it is a theorem of Cleveland's and Swartz. And it states the following, we have that the sum of conic intrinsic volumes of cave conic intrinsic volumes of the all region over, over the all regions of the arrangement. So here R is a region of this arrangement A is up to assign the cave coefficient of the characteristic polynomial. So the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial are just the sums over the conic intrinsic volumes. And now in the special case of reflection arrangements, something very nice happens. Namely, all chambers are isom isometric to each other. So for example, in the case of the A arrangement, we have chambers like this, say something like that, and something like that, any other permutation. But they are isometric to each other. So all, all of them are isometric, which means that in this sum, we just have one term multiplied by the number of chambers. So all chambers or regions are isometric and as a consequence we have the following the case intrinsic volume of the wild chamber of type a so it is the set of all x such that say this holds is the kth coefficient of the characteristic polynomial divided by the number of chambers. So the number of chambers is n factorial and the kth coefficient is denoted by n, n k, where n, k, n over k are the Stirling numbers of the first kind and they are defined as the coefficients of the polynomial t, t plus one, t plus two. So it's essentially the characteristic polynomial but I change, change the signs for convenience. It's 
these are the coefficients of the polynomial. Of this one and the conic intrinsic volumes of the wild chamber of type B. Say one of them is say this one. are given as the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, which now are called B and K. And these are the analogous, B analogous of the Stirling numbers of the first kind. And these numbers are defined as follows. These are the coefficients of the polynomial T plus one, T plus three and so on. And the coefficients are called B and K. So this gives the conic intrinsic volumes of the wild chambers. And uh, the result I mentioned in the previous lecture, namely the probability that convex house of that a convex hull of a random walk contains the origin, can be expressed through these volumes. So we, we have seen that these volumes appear in that result. And by the way, there are many questions in well, in random polytops or stochastic geometry, which lead to the Stirling numbers of the first kind, where B analogous and also to the Stirling numbers of the second kind. But I think there is no time left to explain all these things. Maybe the last thing I would like to mention is that this, uh, we, we know that the, the conic intrinsic volumes form a distribution, a probability distribution. This probability distribution with these probabilities, so here k is, of course, k is zero to n, and here also. This probability distribution is well known. It, it is the distribution of the number of records in a sample of IID observations from a continuous distribution. Or it is the distribution of the number of cycles in a random permutation. So it appears very frequently. And this distribution satisfies the central limit theorem. So we have also a threshold phenomenon answering a question from the last lecture, because this distribution satisfies the central limit theorem exactly as the binomial distribution. So we also have here a phase transition, which, which is very similar to what one has seen in the previous lecture. And it seems also that um, many other questions also lead to to such central limit theorems and phase transitions. I think I will stop here. And in the next lecture, we shall do something completely different. Namely, we shall consider a different class of random polytops, namely polytops which, which are in the simplest case, for example, just the convex house of IID random points chosen uniformly in the ball or chosen uniformly on the sphere. So we shall consider a class of polytops which includes these special cases and relate them to other problems of stochastic geometry. I think I stop here. Many thanks for your attention.